Good evening and welcome to uh, Earth Optimism at Cambridge. Uh, delighted you could join us for this live session on saving species. My name is Mike Maunder. I'm Executive Director of the Cambridge Conservation Initiative and uh, I trained as a plant conservationist and I've spent a lot of my time working on endangered species with numerous colleagues around the world. And I hope you've watched the videos uh, associated with this session and seen extraordinary stuff, whether it's butterflies, marine, birds of prey, island endemics, discussions on how many species we have saved through effective conservation. It's um, been an extraordinary session and now we've got a chance to, to quiz and discuss conservation with three extraordinary individuals. And I think they show collectively that to be a conservationist, you've got to have guts. You've got to be innovative. You've got to be able to deal with disappointments. You've got to be a great networker and a great communicator. And above all, uh, you've got to have a fire in your belly. You have to really have a sense of urgency. So I'm really delighted to introduce my, my three speakers. So I'm going to start off with uh, Professor John Paul Rodriguez. John Paul is um, chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission, the world's largest conservation network dedicated to species. Uh, professor in, in Venezuela and um, head of ProVita. Uh, I think it's worth noting that, uh, John Paul, you started that when you were a student. Yeah, we started in 1987. Actually, yesterday was our 34th anniversary. I was in second semester, 19 years old when we started. It's just amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, I think we're going to be talking about students and that whole what creates that spark to create conservationists today. So my next speaker, who's actually based here in Cambridge at the moment, she's doing the MPhil in conservation leadership, Mariana Martinez del Rio. Mariana, welcome. And I hope you did see Mariana's video. Um, and there is just an astonishing sequence in that when you're ready to soar off with those kids and be a golden eagle. So uh, Mariana, welcome. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing about uh, your project, The Women of the Land, which was GEF funded. So, Mariana, welcome to you. Looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, our third speaker is Dan Danahar, UK based from my old neck of the woods, where I worked many years ago, south coast of England, Brighton. And Dan is from the Dorothy Stranger School near Brighton. And... Dan describes himself as a conservation, a biodiversity educationalist. And I think in what he shares with John and Mariana and, and, and Dan shows us too, they are purveyors of wonder. They are actually all going to talk about something extraordinary this evening. And it's all, I think a lot of this is about sharing the sense of wonder with nature and bringing a bit of your soul to you reawakening a bit of your soul for biodiversity. So without more ado, I think it's time for the questions. So um, let's, we've got some great questions lined up already. Right, so we're gonna start the ball rolling. A question from Stephanie Gonzalez. Uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of species conservation practices in the countries that you have experience in? And we'll get all three <clears throat> of our speakers to comment on this. So. Mariana, could you bring your experience from Mexico to this? Sorry, Mike, I, I have a bit of a trouble. Can you repeat the question? Of course, yes. What are the strengths and weaknesses of species conservation practices in the countries you have experience in? And then there's a little bit of an add-on. What are your recommendations to improve conservation practice and where you've been working? Thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, well, in Mexico, uh, I've been working with 14 species at risk and my, in my experience, some of the strengths of Mexico is that, well, of course, it's a mega diverse country um, and it has an amazing, uh, that's why I grew up uh, like being so passionate about nature. And I think uh, some of um, the strengths on that is that we have a lot to protect, but we also have a lot <laughs> in risk. And that's a, that's a weakness. And uh, another strength is that in Mexico, there are uh, quite uh, some uh, cases of, uh, that have been successful in bringing species like, for example, the condor uh, of California. Mm. They were species that were like already 
almost extinct in wildlife or the Mexican wolf. And uh, so Mexico has significant experience uh, in working with uh, these conservation programs. I think it's something uh, that it's uh, really interesting. And well, yeah, weaknesses is that we have lots of threats. So we need uh, lots of challenges. We need to be able to mainstream biodiversity across sectors. And we need uh, more people uh, that are passionate about this topic and that join us in the movement of conservation. Brilliant. I think the condor is extraordinary recovery. And they're now nesting in Northern California as well. It's amazing. Dan, from your side, from the south of England and with regards to your specialist area of butterflies and butterfly habitats? Um, I suppose in, in my mind, one of the big issues we have in the UK is that because people see sort of wildlife TV programs a lot on, uh, on the television uh, and they read about it, I think in some senses they think they're up on it and they know what it's all about, but that doesn't sort of turn into the application of, of actually doing something on the ground. and. For, uh, to give you an example, in front of my house, I've got a, a piece of land between the road and my house. And, and, and I had to have a conversation with my neighbor to get permission to be able to plant it up with 4,000 wildflower plugs. And I had to explain to him that the value of doing that was that we'd be increasing biodiversity right in front of our houses where we could watch it. And we would have a whole bunch of uh, pollinators come along as a consequence. And, and his response was, but surely, why do we need to do it here? Can't they go somewhere else? And, and it was this incredible lack of like, understanding about the fact that we had to make the effort wherever we could that was just, just so lacking. And, and so uh, uh, from that point of view, I think we still have a massive, massive job with regards to sort of educating people about actually applying ourselves and making a difference within our, our living environment. Uh, but on the, on the positive, I think that once you do do things, once you do things like habitat restoration that, and people see the results, then it's overwhelming. And I had a chap who, um, who's an air pollutionist, in fact, and, and he, uh, in the lockdown here in the UK, uh, was, was cycling and uh, he didn't realise there'd be any cars on the road and a car smashed into him and lo and behold, um, uh, he was all uh, broken ribs and everything. And over the course of his recuperation, he found a butterfly haven that I'd been working on, a, a habitat that we're, we'd been uh, putting in, uh, saving species on. And for him personally, that was a massive thing that helped him recover. So psychologically, really? to go and see them on a daily basis. So I do think that the, the, the opportunity is there, but we still got a lot to do. You're right. A lot of this is down to personal experience and having that sense of bringing nature back wherever you can. John Paul, from your perspective from Venezuela, not yeah, an easy place to work, I suspect. Yeah, yeah well, you should all come visit anytime. Happy to welcome you. Um, here, I think that one of our challenges is that we have a really fantastic theoretical framework. We have great laws, uh, fun, you know, amazing protected areas, network, mm -hmm. really uh, a lot of nature is protected. And I think to some extent, it's because our economy has been based on mining and oil and other minerals. So it's very focused in few parts of the country. And then there are large extents, you know, large areas that haven't been uh, transformed. And also there's a recognition of the value of having forests to provide water to cities so we have a really uh, large network of protected areas around cities. The problem that we have is that when you go down to people's individual needs, so when you think of someone who has some kind of uh, environmental infraction, let's say a poacher or uh, someone who chops up a tree for to sell it, um, often the law enforcement officers nearby will be known to them, they'll be maybe mm. family members, maybe, you know, they grew up together. So it is very difficult for them to actually enforce the laws and, um, and um, you know, punish them for the environmental uh, um, law breaking moment. So I think that's something we have to really is bring a, a notion of public recognition that, um, you know, hunting and poaching and deforesting, et cetera, are, are crimes as well as yes. any other crime. And we have to be able to recognize that uh, nationally. And I think that we still, it is, very, it, it is very normal for a police officer to let go someone who, who committed an environmental crime just because we, perhaps because of our mining culture, we think that nature is out there 
for us to extract from it, and we have the right to do that. So there's a, a really interesting uh, sort of trade-off and in, in confrontational values that we are working on very hard in thinking how to deal with. And I'm sure this happens in other parts of the world as well. I think it does, including the UK. I must just point out that one of my sort of um, big formative moments was going to the Protected Areas Congress in Caracas in 1992. And it was just an amazing meeting and to suddenly see the energy of the Latin American conservation community was just brilliant. And uh, that, was my first, some... that was my first meeting where I, my first sort of public appearance. So it was great. <laughs> brilliant. I, I, I would like to say that I remember it, but I... I, I... <laughs> <laughs> right. We have a question, Mariana, another question for you. Um, this is um, from Fernanda Heredia. What difficulties have you seen and are most common when incentivizing women empowerment through species conservation projects in rural environments? I think this is absolutely for you. Great. Uh, yeah, this is a big, a big challenge. Um, for example, in the context that I work with in Mexico with local communities, normally there are lots of chauvinism. And uh, yeah, like I think one of the main uh, challenges is that uh, chauvinism is embedded in the culture. So it's not just about something about conservation, specific about conservation. It's just something um, that it's <laughs> in, the, in the general culture. And I think sometimes the way we try to address uh, these issues, uh, sometimes it might work in one side or in one community, but it might not work in another community. And uh, something that I've seen that has happened uh, working like in these projects, uh, trying to encourage women uh, that has worked uh, really, really well. Sometimes it's really organic. It's just like uh, in, in areas where we had women working in the field, field officers, instead of being male officers, uh, that sort of uh, already broke a scheme and uh, the woman would feel more confident to, be, to join the conservation movement because it was led by a woman in the field. And just seeing a woman leading a project in the, in the field in a chauvinism context, that is just uh, something that organically attracts attention. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's really like challenging, but uh, it's something that definitely needs to be uh, looked case by case. And it's, uh, yeah, like not just putting quotes of women, certain women that has to work here, but how do you attract them? At what hours? How do you do this strategy so women can be able to join and maybe also can do the things that they normally use, do in their day-to-day -day life? So yeah, how can, how, how can women make this a part of their life within their context? I think we're seeing some extraordinary transitions in conservation and, and we have um, species conservation, like all conservation, has a history of exclusion. And what, what really struck me was the intergenerational commitment within your project in Mexico and that it was women led. And what struck me was the, the magic, the enthusiasm of your project participants. They, I'm going to ask, following on from your question, I'm going to ask everyone else a, a question. I will almost get to the point that some of your women fell in love with the eagle. There was, a, there was an affection. There was a, um, a respect for the eagle. It was, is that the case? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, it was just like they, yeah, they fall in love with the, with the eagle. And it was, yeah, like really beautiful because like uh, how I'm going to say it briefly, but how it all started, it was like this... Um, woman field officer, Alejandra. She went and gave a, an environmental education talk uh, to an elementary school. And then the kids were so interested that they went and asked to their moms, like, how, uh, what about the old golden eagle in my hometown? And the, the mothers uh, didn't know. <laughs> so they went to the field officer again, and they asked her, like, I want to know more to be able to explain. And then they started uh, giving these uh, environmental education workshops. Uh, when they would normally be uh, in the households, they they wouldn't do these roles normally. So they started uh, being interested. They started being paid. That that's another thing. Uh, so they start bringing well, them to their house, and then they say like, "Okay, we've been uh, giving these workshops all this time, and we say that the golden eagle normally put uh, two eggs." 
but we haven't seen them. Where are they? <laughs> so they started like getting interested in going there out there to the mountains. And they actually like some people of the community wouldn't believe that they would be able to go that high because there are like really big mountains out there. Uh, but they did and they are doing it now and they kept doing it. Actually, the environmental uh, minister, yeah, like the in, in Mexico is now really interested in this case and they are supporting this woman. And it has also become like a, a big thing and an inspiration for other women uh, that maybe they don't believe that they are able to do that because they don't have the support. But now they just are like in love and they even said like, even if we don't receive economic resources, we're just going to keep doing this because <laughs> it has changed our lives. It's just like, yeah, that's, it's really beautiful. So there's, when we're working with species, there's a, there's a, there's an emotional transition where they move from, from taxonomic entities to something that we're actually deeply emotionally committed to. And I think it's a magical moment, often with young people, when you introduce them to an endangered species and there is that transition. And Dan, I'd like to follow that point up with you. You're doing that on a, on a daily basis at your work at the school. Do, what, how do you manage that, that transition from, I don't know, let's say bored teenagers who will not admit to any sort of passion about anything and suddenly getting that spark of lightning and, and getting into butterflies, getting into nature? Can I just correct you, actually? I am retired now. <laughs> I've retired <laughs> since uh, the 11th of February. But, um, yeah, I think there's very simple little things. I mean, one of the first things that we did was put in an educational pond and... Um, thousands of children have been able to do that. It's almost like, I feel like that should be a birthright of every child to be able to dip into a pond and discover all of that wildlife. Um, but one, you know, one of the very simple things which became a mantra for me was that they would look at something that they'd never seen before in their lives. And the first thing that normally came out of their mouths would be, uh. And I would say, no, not uh, wow. Yeah. And then they would say, well. And then suddenly you would see there was a transformation because there is this natural disconnect for children who aren't engaged with nature. They don't really know how to contact, uh, connect with it. And suddenly they knew part of the terminology, part of the vocabulary to use. And that, that helped them identify the emotional dynamic themselves. And so, you know, one of the things we would do is uh, record butterfly numbers or bee numbers or do bird counts. Uh, and for us, that would be, you know, we were saying in its most simplest form, we're looking at raising people's bioliteracy by knowing the names of species, uh, by recording the, the numbers of different uh, organisms, we'd say they're increasing their binumeracy, just a very basic concept. But we also brought in this concept of bioempathy, which is a made up word. I'm waiting for it to come into the Oxford English uh, Dictionary. And um, the idea would be that... Uh, by doing these things and being involved, that they would become empathic uh, with the needs of nature. And one of the things we do after doing pond dipping is saying, can I just ask you a question? How would you feel if you came back tomorrow and you saw that someone had dumped a load of rubbish in that pond? And then children, some children would occasionally say, that's a bit like dumping a load of rubbish in our house, isn't it? And then suddenly I'd say, well, your bioenergy we skills have just been raised. So yeah, I think there is a whole, a whole thing about vocabulary, a whole thing about learning language, and a whole thing about getting kids out there and, 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 and human beings in contact with nature. Yeah, absolutely. John Paul, looking at, at the other end, what was the moment that crystallised your commitment to species? Well, I think it was my childhood. I grew up, I grew up here in, in Venezuela, in, in, the, in the Caribbean coast. My father was an economist. Uh, he was a, uh, he escaped the civil war in Spain. So he came to Venezuela from, from Guernica. My family was in Guernica when the German mm, bombed and wow, the famous yes. Picasso painting was made. So they eventually left and came to Venezuela. And I think that he was, a, well, he was an economist by trade, something he had to do to maintain the family. But I think at heart, he was a naturalist. So, so the whole family, um, my mother, my sister, and I would be camping and fishing here on the coast of the Caribbean by ourselves in these giant beaches since I was four or five. I remember being in charge of fires, and I had a machete in one hand and a fishing reel in the other hand, and that's what I did. I spent the day making the fire. 
So um, yeah. there was exposure to nature from early on, I think that really made, made me be a biologist in the conservation. I think it was the same for me. I was um, brought up, my father was a botanist and horticulturist and uh, his love was chasing down rare types of apple. And so the weekends would be spent going around the old gardens and estates of the south of England looking for old apple varieties, manky things like cat's head dating back to the Elizabethan era. But it was all about nature. It was all about chasing the lost and trying to preserve. Diversity, diversity, yeah. And what yeah. impact did that have on you, Mike? It made me very antisocial. I lost me all my friends at the weekend. So we have a, actually a quite serious question from Marianne Weston in, in Mexico. And um, Marianne writes, as a conservationist myself, sometimes I struggle to be optimistic about the future for wildlife, especially in countries where the government has no environmental agenda. What is your best advice for recharging optimism? What is your constant motivation? Mariana, what, what keeps you motivated? Well, I I guess I, I I like some people tell me like, oh Mariana, but isn't it like depressing that you the job that you have like listening to all these uh declines and stuff like that? But uh actually like I feel like my best motivation is like I'm just so in love with this that I couldn't imagine myself doing something different. And I do believe that people and we we can all shape the world together. So um, this, for example, this example of this woman in this part of Mexico, where I'm, I'm sure they are the first uh, woman group in that part uh, that starts being a group of monitors. Um, so that just like being able to happen and sharing these stories uh, can inspire and suddenly bring trans uh, transformative change. Uh, so I think we all shape uh, the world. Sometimes we are not uh, happy with, <laughs> with uh, things yeah. that are going on, but I, get, I guess it's up to us just like being there and complain or being there, do something and be an agent of, of change towards uh, building the world that we would like to see. Um, and these, these uh, examples and, and these, in general, this festival, I want to congratulate you because it's awesome to hear of, of all these stories and it all uh, motivate us um, to keep working in, in what we're working because you can see that it's having an impact. I think that's right, isn't it? Just got to keep going. Dan, how do you maintain um, optimism? No, I'd just like to say really that I feel like Mariana and John Paul are my brother and sister because <laughs> is, I've been saying that I can't change the world but I changed my small part of the world with the sure and certain knowledge that there are brothers and sisters all over the planet doing their yes. bit wherever they can. And I think that's what's so fantastic about Earth Optimism because it demonstrates that really, really clearly that we are doing it and we are making a difference. And wherever uh, I've worked with colleagues, with the public, wherever we, we've done work and we've shown that you can make a difference, the response that you get back is tenfold. It's you yeah. know, the, the, the absolute astonishment that people show you in, in their appreciation of the work that you do. In, in, in one case, in, in, in one very small uh, bit of habitat restoration we've done, we now have, a, have recorded 81% of our city's butterflies in a half a football pitch sized piece of land, 81%. I mean, I know that we're in temperate Northern Europe, but 81% is 81% wherever you are in the world and it's still damn good. So I think, you know, it is possible to do these things. So I think that's the most important thing to bear in mind. Yes, John Paul, I know you, you're inherently optimistic. I, I, I'm, I'm irrationally optimistic, but I have, I have a friend who was once traveling in Southern Mexico, Northern Guatemala, I don't remember. And he said to me that he was in this forest, this real forest, tropical forest, big trees, forest, 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 as much as you can imagine a forest, but it was strange. It was full of regular shapes, like triangular shapes. The mountains were very regular. And he wondered why these mountains were so regular. And he realized and discovered they were pyramids. They were pyramids that were covered by forest. Just a few hundred years before, it was completely deforested land. And now it was forest full of jaguars and tapirs and all the things that you think of inhabit, you know, mature forests. So, so my, my lesson from that was like, you know, nature, nature returns, nature recovers. If you let her do it, she will come back. So if you think, and like I said on my video, if you think of so much more money is being spent on destroying nature than on saving it, if you could just tip that balance 
even ever so slightly in favor of nature, she will come back. So well, that's, that's my thinking. You know, there, there are missed examples with fisheries, with many examples of um, where if you let them recover, they will do it. Yes. So that's, that's my source of optimism. I think you've all caught it. Um, this is um, really, um, it's sometimes very difficult in conservation. I mean, it, we've all had conservation failures. And I talked about the whole sort of the scarring of extinction. Uh, um, those of us that have had sort of species fall through our hands in, in, in effect, it does scar you. Um, but then it's the companionship of your other conservationists. It's as Dan said, it's the communication, the, the sort of community of conservationists and working out what you can do to make things better in, within your power and knowing that it reverberates and resonates. And I think that's a, that's a key thing. Um, and there will be days when you think it's difficult. There'll be many, many more days when you've got something akin to Dan's butterfly reserve or the, the forest coming back or the eagles breeding. Um, those are the days to celebrate and they're fantastic. And it's just work towards those days because the payback is immeasurable. Right. I have a question from Aiden Berg on wildlife corridors. Um, I'm going to throw that to John Paul and then to Dan, um, because I think we're going to get wildlife corridors on different scales. So start off with John Paul, wildlife corridors. Yeah, so I think that one, one major uh, item on our agenda in the next few years is going to be forest restoration or ecosystem restoration yes. in, a, in a general sense. I think that um, there are lots of opportunities to reconnect the spaces that have been degraded. There are many opportunities for us to meet challenges like the bond challenge in terms of planting massive amounts of trees around the world. And uh, when you look at corridors, there's some very artificial corridors that we see often, uh, you know, on Facebook and other places like over highways or under highways, and they're very effective. But you also see corridors that can, in southern Brazil, in the in the Mata Atlantica, which, yes. which have have really massively recovered ecosystems there. So I, I think it's part of the same message that I that I said before. You know, if you give nature a chance, she'll come back. And if we reconnect existing bits of ecosystems, they will start working how they know to work. You know, no no being a kind of a, um, a careful term there, but uh, absolutely, it's it's something that I think is fundamental and, and something that I really hope that we can push in the next few years more actively. And I, I think particularly through agricultural landscapes, we, we're going to need those corridors to allow the connections. Yeah. Dan, you're, pollinators, you're operating... Pollinators are, a big, pollinators are a big theme that we have to uh, come back to as well. Yeah. Indeed, we may come on to those. I suspect there's a question about pollinators later. Okay, good. Dan, you're operating on the boundaries between a Quite a you know, densely packed city, Brighton and Chalk Downlands, one of the UK's richest habitats. And what's your experience in creating corridors, particularly in urban and agricultural landscapes? Yeah, I think that, that first of all, I'd just like to say that I agree entirely with Jean Paul that, that given a chance, nature does rebound. And, you know, a, you know particularly insects that I'm working with, they breed really, really fast and, and, and populations can increase very, very quickly if you get conditions right. Um, in a way, I think this idea of, of corridors, in a way, is a bit misleading because it, it, I immediately think of linear things, you know, uh, connecting one thing to another. Whereas where we live in the UK, I, I tend to think of our environment, our, our landscape is quite industrialised. We have a very intensive agriculture, uh, you know. Um, we use lots of pesticides. We have tons and tons of fragmented, well, not tons of fragmented habitat. That's half the problem, but we've got fragmented habitat. So really, you know, a lot of my work is about creating what I call surrogate habitat. I'm not trying to create semi-natural habitats. I'm not trying to create ancient grasslands or woodlands. We're trying to create something which is a, a surrogate for, in my case, invertebrate communities. And therefore the greater number of species we get there in some way, some measures, particularly if of success, particularly if they're, uh, you know, uh, species that, that that have been declining um but you know the, the real issue is about getting habitat wherever you can get it in in, in yes. my part of the world so you know uh, we had uh, in in the school that i worked we had a football pitch that contractors put in a big artificial football pitch with uh, 
uh, you know, this AstroTurf stuff, which is a, a durable thing because we'd gone from a score of 600 children to 1,700. Uh, and the contractors wanted to cover the chalk that they'd cut out with, with perennial ryegrass. And it took a lot of persuading to get that ryegrass uh, not put in place and get the children to put host plants for butterflies and other invertebrates. And, and, and within 18 months, we had two nationally rare butterfly species colonizing that area. Hardly anyone goes there, but in a way that doesn't matter. I mean, it's, in some ways it's a tragedy because I think people do need to see these things. But on the other hand, if every little bit of land that no one ever went to was good quality land, then you've, you've got to get it right. But the message yet again has got to get through. So I work with planners and I, I talk to, uh, to developers and I do my best wherever I can to explain to them what they can do in a very small way to make a big difference. Uh, and uh, so corridors, yeah, are important, but this whole idea about meta populations within, within the landscape conservation uh, approach is, is really important. I absolutely agree. Tomorrow, there is a session on biophilic design. Uh, so same time, same place tomorrow. I also, I mean, I've had great fun building butterfly gardens in one or two places and the joy of the abundance is just magical um and there's a you know you're going out on a, i've done it in the uk where you might see six or seven species in the day it, but if you get it right it really works now there's a question here from um oh this is a very good question from michael edmonston straight this is one i really was hoping we'd be asked and would you, how would you go about saving those species that receive very little recognition, funding and attention in the conservation world? One in three freshwater fish, for instance, are threatened with extinction, yet they receive very little airtime. Good. How do we look beyond, as a botanist, what we refer to as the wet nose jobs, the mammals? Um, what's going on beyond that? Uh, so, Mariana, from your context in Mexico, you, you've get a lot of attention for a very iconic species, the golden eagle, but you've been working with other species as well. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Actually, I was working with uh, lots of emblematic species, like it was golden eagle, it was jaguar, it was, um, yeah, tapir, uh, the six species of uh, sea, sea turtles that nest in Mexico. So they were all emblematic and um, the concept of working with emblematic species is, is that the actions that you would do for that species would conserve all the ecosystem. Because um, when, when you, when you uh, work with these uh, species that uh, require a large territory and you don't work just uh, in the monitoring of the species, you work in the restoration of the habitat, in the environmental education, uh, and you can also include some other species that are maybe not as charism charismatic to get funding from people that are uh, not familiar with conservation, so maybe they won't be attractive to, to some species. But yeah, like these, these uh, emblematic species are, are a good way. Uh, however, I do think that we need to work more in, in communication in also like bringing up the importance of the species, not just like the love of the species. Of course, we want to protect it because it's beautiful and we want to have it there. But what is the role of that species and the ecosystem and how even though if you wouldn't love species, <laughs> what is your benefit of having them in the ecosystem? So I think we do need to do more communication in that side. However, in my project, it was all emblematic species, but we were also covering some other non-emblematic species. So there's the power of the icon to carry the conservation of the habitat and the landscape. Exactly. Sometimes works, I think. Sometimes we might question it. Dan, your... Well, your I, work, I just generally work. agree, really. You know, I mean, I call them flagship species, emblematic species, flagship species. Yeah. I mean, that's what we use butterflies for. But much of my work, I mean, as a child, I was passionate about butterflies. In fact, as an adult, I've become passionate about butterflies. But the gap in between, there were other things that I was passionate about. And I came back to butterflies because they're a fantastic vehicle for change and for carrying people's interest in the natural world. And so on the habitat restoration work that I've been doing in my city or, or getting people aware of ecosystem services, by getting them to count butterflies. I mean, that was one of the first projects we ever did was, was doing a, a butterfly count to get people to think about why biodiversity loss was important. Um, but um, I, the bottom line is, is that 
we have entomologists and we have botanists who come to the sites where we've, 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 we've created habitat for, this, for the butterflies, but you find so many other things as well, the little mm. cogs within the ecosystems. And then that's your chance when you're doing your PowerPoint talks and you're talking to groups and whatever, and you tell them about these little cogs, you know, these strange and weird and nationally notable insect species you might, might not otherwise be aware of. And that's when people start, you know, just, I think just for a moment, they start thinking about it and they start thinking about what, why they're important. I have to say though, it is much to my chagrin that even butterflies are not nearly as popular as sheep in my city. You can go two miles outside my city and see sheep everywhere, bring the sheep into town so they graze it for the habitat management and people flock for miles. So <laughs> I don't really know why that is. Yeah, there's a, there's a dangerous magic about mammals. Yeah. <laughs> John Paul, Species Survival Commission has specialist groups that cover everything from fungal, fung, fungi, I think you've got five different specialist groups for fungi, through to the mammals, but with everything, everything in between, whether it's corals, plants, conifers, cycads, butterflies, grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. What's your role? How do we look after those often overlooked but vital species? Yeah, we, we cover from chytrid fungus, who are very, very tiny to blue whales. So yeah. that's like seven or 10 orders of magnitude in size of organisms. So it's a lot of, a lot of species. So uh, our specialist groups are certainly, are certainly biased towards vertebrates and towards the larger furry, feathery things. But we have a very increasing movement to try to recognize other species groups. So one, one, one statistic that I find really remarkable is that 99%, let me say that again, 99% of the biosphere is underwater, 99%. I'm not talking about, you know, like 10%, 99%. And yet we, we always think about terrestrial organisms as the indicators of, of, of life, of biology. So I think that we, well, we, we're certainly working very hard to try to increase the number of of fungal specialist groups and vertebrate specialist groups and the marine. I mean, we have one mollusk specialist group, for example, that has tens or hundreds of thousands of species. And we, we, we have also an African elephant specialist group that has one or two species in this yeah, group. So we, yeah, now it's two. <laughs> so we, we certainly have to work on, on, uh, on expanding that. And that's a, that's a great priority. But you know, a great priority for us is not only the species diversity, but also the people's diversity. Our specialist group network is mostly uh, white males from the north. That's yeah. the kind of uh, average member in our network. So anybody here who is not that and lives in a diverse, mega diverse country, for example, like Mariana was saying before, like Mexico, and is interested in conservation, we want to hear from you because we want to increase the number of women, we want to increase the number of young people, we want to increase people who are not academics. We want to know from uh, you know, NGOs, from government, from other professions, we want uh, you know, journalists and, and graphic designers and people who have other ways to help us communicate. Our, our, our job is you know, saving species and not just about biology, it's about many other things. And that's something that we are actively, actively working on expanding and seeking your help to make that happen. Brilliant, that's great to know. I mean, Species Survival Commission is an extraordinary asset for, for global conservation. And personally speaking, if, if you're embarking on a conservation biology career, and we would all encourage you to do so because it's intensely rewarding and, you know, planet depends on us. I would encourage you to look beyond the big mammals and look at these other areas of extraordinary importance, whether it's I mean, the whole conservation biology of fungi, we rarely are at the early stages of it, uh, or the conservation management of corals or soil biota. Tremendous opportunities there to do really good stuff. So have a think about it. And that leads us on very nicely to a question from uh, Misty Dunn. Misty, you're asking, how do I start to save and protect our species and nature right here around me to all around the world? Are there some type of groups I can volunteer with to get onto the path of learning how to save species and nature. I'm going to throw that one at Dan. Dan, how'd you start? You've got the passion, you want to do something. Well, you know, one of the things which absolutely astonishes me is that the, over the, you, you probably know about this yourself, Mike. I mean, over the last 40 years, I've been giving talks in different specialist groups and slowly my audience hair has greyed more and more and more. The sea of grey hair 
has become profound. And uh, I was really despairing until I started using social media. Uh, and now on Facebook, there are thousands of individuals who have incredible amounts of skill in terms of looking at spiders or bees or mollusks or slime molds. The audience is out there. It's massive, you know, all you have to do is go out there and, and, and search on social media and you'll find, you know, thousands of people with thousands of ideas uh, and they're all, you know, obviously quite disparate and many of them talking from different parts of the planet. I mean, I myself through a Facebook group that I set up seven years ago, have now founded an organization called Corfu Butterfly Conservation, where we are looking at surveying the butterflies of Corfu over the next five years, producing a definitive comprehensive atlas of the butterflies of Corfu, um, uh, 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 so that we can help influence uh, policy and help the Greek authorities to protect uh, their natural heritage. You know, that's come through social media. I think that's like massive and on a daily basis, I speak to my colleagues in, in, in Corfu, either on Facebook or with Twitter or with the, well, as we're doing now, because it's possible. And who would have ever yeah. believed that? So I do think there's a lot of, a lot of potential there to make things yeah. happen. I, I would recommend if you're, if you're thinking of making that commitment and getting into conservation, and again, we, we encourage you to do that, Misty. Um, Look at your county naturalist trust if you're here in the UK as extraordinary organisations running nature reserves and they run brilliant volunteer programmes and they all and they have professional staff that you can engage with and, and learn from. And similarly, citizen science programmes, British Trust for Ornithology, RSPB do similar things. Uh, National Trust here in the UK does volunteering. And then uh, depending where you are, think about looking at your agricultural colleges, your local university for short courses and training, and then follow your instincts. You're in at that point and uh, the enthusiasm and commitment will, will carry you along. But I think volunteering is a really good way, particularly with science-based organizations like the County Naturalist Trust. John Paul's organization is a volunteer network. So there's a great opportunity to, I cut my teeth within the Species Survival Commission years ago as a young conservationist being mentored by some of their members. So. Um, Get involved in the Species Survival Commission. It's a, it's a great group. Now we're getting towards the end and there's a really profound question has just come in. So guys, we're going to um, give this one some attention. Saving species is not just about biology. What else is it about? John Paul. Well, ultimately, saving species is about all of us agreeing that we uh, that it is right to share the world with them. I mean, uh, I heard once a long time ago, uh, Robert May, who was a very distinguished scientist say, sure, you know, there'll be life on earth a hundred years from now, but would you want to live on that? Earth? And I think that's the right question. I think that, you know, life will go on. It, it, like I said before, nature, if you give, give her space, will go on. But we want a world that is covered with weeds and cockroaches <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. Or do we want a world that has the diversity that we are uh, used to living with? And I think that that's, the, that's what we have to you know, uh, imagine and envision. And we're all used to a world that is richer than that. And we like it. We at least I do. And I hope that we can all agree that that's the future we aim for. Yeah. Mariana, it's not just science. What else is it? Well, I think uh, it's uh, in 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 my experience is love for life, uh, is love for Earth. It's just like uh, opening our eyes and just being aware of all the amazing things we get from nature: the water we have, the the air we breathe, the birds that we see, uh, and just like all the leisure that we can. Uh, have and that feeling of being in a forest or being in a natural area I think that doesn't have a price so I think uh, it's more than science it's something that uh, people have to realize that it's not a task just for conservationists or environmentalists to solve hmm. uh, the environmental crisis because if we think that we are not getting anywhere so I think it's it's about like what what am I doing and how can I from my place from my field of stu studies contribute either in my day-to-day -day life 
or if I want to do more, well, go go and do more. But yeah, it's I, I think it's much more than than science. Of course, science can can help us to see how how well are we doing or how bad are we doing or get get information and lots of more things. But yeah, it's it's um, conservation is about just everyone. And in terms of local communities, uh, it's also um, about a way of living. Um, how, how do local communities be engaged and not fighting against uh, conservationists and how can they also include and benefit from conservation? In, in Mexico, in the project that we were working with, we were working really, really closely with uh, improving livelihoods uh, for communities. And I was able and lucky enough to see some really nice uh, examples of successful stories on how um, communities start getting to do sustainable management and they start benefiting and then they were really happy because they knew that the next generations would be able to also get an income from that and also yeah. get all the benefits from the environmental uh, ecosystem services so yeah it's it's much more than science uh yeah dan is much more than science what is it from your perspective um i think you know these things these iPhones and whatever they're amazing aren't they and I watch children messing about with them all day long and uh, it sometimes I despair a little bit because I know that 50 years ago in the UK there wasn't such distractions and people would be going out looking at butterflies and looking at birds and looking at flowers and stuff like that and being engaged and much of my work has been a bit about trying to get children to re-engage in that way and I, I one of the things I like to do is write the words on the board uh, do not read these words uh, and of course, you realise it's a paradox. As soon as you try, you read it, you realise you shouldn't have read it. Then I do it in Dutch and then they realise they can't read it. And I say to the kids, well, listen, this is a bit like you guys and, and the natural world. You, you don't know how to read the natural world. And I think really there are so many things that we can say about uh, why conserving wildlife is important. But if we have to rationalise it and intellectualise it, we're kind of somehow missing the point. If you have to ask that question, you really need to just get out and experience it. I think that's the bottom line. <laughs> I think that is a brilliant way of summing it up. Um, John Paul, Dan, Mariana, we have had an extraordinary session this evening. Thank you very much for your time. Um, my own view, it, it's not just science. It is extraordinary science often, and it is exhilarating science, but it's also the thrill of the wonder of nature. And the fact that Species are part of nature and species underpin our existence. You know, there's a fundamental need for us to keep the inventory of species if we want to keep society going in a way that we want it. But often it's just about wonder. And as you say, Dan, getting out there, getting on your knees, looking at butterflies, standing up, looking at the eagles and um, just enjoying the, the, the extraordinary panorama of life that we've inherited and making sure we, we pass it on. So I'm gonna draw this reluctantly to a close. Speakers, thank you so much. I think as uh, Dan said, I think we've all discovered we share a lot of the, the empathy and, and love for species. There's a lot more going on with Earth Optimism Cambridge and I encourage you to um, look at the website. We've got great uh, events coming up tomorrow and Sunday. So tomorrow we've got um, Tony Juniper talking about making space and rewilding. We've got an urban biophilic discussion. And on Sunday, we have Sir David Attenborough, uh, questions and answers with Sir David. So um, to all of you who are in the business, all power to you and for all of you that want to start making a contribution to species conservation, come and join us. There's a lot to do and we welcome you on board. Thanks everyone, take care. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm.